go. Good evening, everyone. This is Benedict Klecka, your friendly librarian director, presenting from the historic Harrison Room of the Redwood Library, found in 1747. Uh, tonight, we have part two of a four-part series by John Church, whom you know well. Uh, last week, it was uh, Droningholm Palace in Sweden, uh, where we came to understand the influence of French culture on Sweden and the connection. Uh, this week, we're going south to Austria uh, and to come to appreciate uh, German Rococo. Uh, and so, uh, you know John Church, of course, uh, formerly the chief curator of the PS, uh, an architectural historian uh, affiliated with RISD, uh, and he's spoken here many times. And um, it bears reminding, and he'll remind you, and I'm, I'm reminding you, uh, that the Redwood, of course, is deeply invested in architectural history uh, by virtue of structure, the earliest public neoclassic building, uh, the Cary Collection, uh, among others, where we are rich in uh, pattern books, uh, big folio illustrated books, builder's manuals, etc., etc. So uh, in many ways, as John will explain to you, uh, this series of talks uh, is coincident with our special collections. So without further ado, I want to welcome everyone. And uh, here is John Church. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. And thank you, Benedict. I have a gentle tale to tell tonight about Schönborn Palace, which is known as the Well of Beauty in German. And it is a story of architecture, design, and craft. And when Benedict mentioned the Redwood Library collection of pattern books, this idea of design and craft disseminated through literature uh, informs my approach to Schönborn Palace, buildings and books, buildings and books together. And I must confess, my grandmother and grandfather were Austrian. My last name is Austrian. And so Schönbrunn Palace has a special place within this Austrian mindset. And it's also a World Heritage Site. So without further ado, as this image comes up, we'll begin to investigate the word Schönbrunn itself. Schönbrunn. I call it a dream in a beautiful spring. The word Schönbrunn means beautiful spring or beautiful well. This notion that the palace was built around a spring. Schönbrunn is on, on the outskirts of Vienna. Now it's a 20 minute ride from central Vienna. And in this image of the palace presenting itself to you, you see Vienna in the distance. This first began as a hunting lodge. But the Habsburg dynasty, of course, ruled the vast Austrian empire, did not build this great palace until the six, late 1680s. Why was that when Louis XIV was busy at Versailles as early as the 1660s? That's because Vienna was the bulwark of Western Christendom. And in 1683, as late as that, the Turks were besieging Vienna. Vienna itself had its medieval walls around it. You could not afford to build in the countryside. When the Turks laid siege to Vienna in 1683, the last time they did lay siege, they devastated the hunting lodge that was Schönbrunn. But with the 1680s, with the last siege by the Turks, the opening up of the countryside around Vienna begins, and great palaces begin to rise, and Schönbrunn would be this. Schönbrunn is very much associated with this person, especially now many emperors and empresses and archdukes and archduchesses and princes and princesses made their home in Schönbrunn Palace. But it would be this woman, Maria Theresa, considered the mother of the empire. She arose to the throne in 1740. Her father had been the emperor Charles VI. She had 16 children. Here she is with about 13 of them. One of her more famous or infamous was, of course, Marie Antoinette, who would be married off to the young Louis the, uh, Louis the Dauphin of France, later to become Louis XVI. But here they're seen presented 
in the 1760s with Schönbrunn Palace behind them. The Hofburg, the main family residence in central Vienna, was a rather labyrinth of a building uh, confined within the city walls. So it was at Schönbrunn, decorated by Maria Theresa, that would become the primary residence of the family. Let's take a look at this Austrian empire, this strange conglomeration of nation states. Here it is in the 18th century. And then as the Turkish Empire retreated, the Austrians began to conquer the East. Of course, the Habsburgs were known not as much as conquerors as diplomats. There was one famous line that said, oh, you happy Austria, grow your empire not by conquest, but by marriage or inheritance. The Austrian House of Habsburg kept inheriting crowns. So they wore the crown of St. Stephen. They wore the crown of Bohemia to the north. But Maria Theresa was the one to modernize this great empire. And she would do so from her seat at Schönbrunn Palace. And here is the very well, the very natural spring in Schönbrunn Palace that gives the place its name. It had these wonderful natural springs they would bottle the water, and this is why the palace became the place to summer by the monarchs. Construction began on the palace under the reign of the Emperor Leopold, actually, in the 1680s. And then later, Charles VI, the father of Maria Theresa, would use it that made it home. The gardens are essential. They're an essential part of Schönbrunn Palace. The Habsburg princes and princesses consider themselves a dynasty of gardeners, and we'll talk about this as we go through. But this is the entrance to the privy garden, the private enclosed garden of the monarchs, lush with roses, and this 18th century uh, French-inspired trellised garden gazebo. Here, though, is the original plan, <clears throat> the original Baroque plan of this palace complex. Now, Schönbrunn is often referred to as the Austrian Versailles, you know, this grand Baroque summer residence. And it does follow many of the examples of Versailles. If you can uh, look at the very bottom of the image, the palace is at the very bottom of the image, but it's the park with these grand radial avenues uh, extending from the palace that are very much inspired by Versailles. But I think there is a very important difference here, quite critical. Versailles was the main seat of Louis XIV. The seat at Versailles about Apollo that is meant to convey Louis XIV's almost descent from Apollo. While Schönbrunn is a great Baroque palace, it has a much softer atmosphere. There's no grand iconographic program here relating the Habsburgs to the gods. Although the Habsburgs were one of the oldest ruling dynasties of Europe, a powerful dynasty, the Austrian court itself, once they were not do, uh, conducting their official court ceremonial, had a rather much more relaxed approach to life, whereas the French monarchy was always on display. The Austrian monarchs had a private life. So in summation, there was a softer atmosphere to Schönbrunn than the power, uh, the, the imagery of power projected at Versailles. Here you have it. You have these grand avenues. There are horse chestnut trees, but these are hornbeams, which do very well with this type of pleaching to create these green avenues to the palace. But Versailles, which is of a buff-colored limestone, presents a certain formal image. The exterior of Schönbrunn during this was even nicknamed Maria Theresa Yellow. Now, this is only hypothetical, but I feel the idea actually came from northern Italy. Many an Italian building is brick covered in stucco and painted in this yellow color. Italian architects were highly influential in Vienna, as well as French architects. Austrian Baroque and later Rococo design from the late 16 and early 1700s is very much a melding of French and Italian influences with an Austrian Germanic sensibility. But the yellow softens the building. Here's the overall view from nowadays of the palace. On the right hand side of the image is the forecourt. There's the palace itself. 
In the lower right-hand corner of this image are the Royal Conservatory and greenhouses for propagating rare fruits, flowers. To the north, on the upper right-hand side of the image, is the private garden of the Habsburgs. In the center of the photograph leading out is the Grand Parterre, are the woodlands, or the bosquets, as they're called in French. And as your eye moves to the left, you see the zigzag paths making their way? Well, they're making their way up a hillside. To then, in the center far left, the Gloriette, which was built in the latter part of Maria Theresa's reign. And the Gloriette was a summer pavilion where she could take her work, give, uh, uh, she would stage parties here, and it was a viewing platform over the Vienna Hills, the Vienna Woods, and with distant views of the city. This was Fischer von Erlach's original concept for Schönbrunn. Fischer von Erlach was one of the great Baroque architects of Vienna in the late 1600s, and his vision was to enter a grand courtyard and actually climb the hill, and the palace was intended to be placed on the hill where the Gloriette now stands. The Habsburgs, although they ruled a great empire, were never as wealthy as the Bourbon of France. And so economy prevailed, though they decided to build the the hillside vacant until they finally built the Gloriette. Here's the guard, here's the entrance facade as finally built. So the previous image is the proposed grandiose design of Fischer von Erlach. And you'll notice there are two columns at the entrance. These were designed to be copies of Trajan's column from Rome, this idea of this ancient Roman triumphal column. In the end, they made simple obelisks. I'll show you that in a moment. And here is the revised plan. You have the stable block in front, two Egyptian obelisks, the formal front of the palace, the parterre garden beyond, and then a proposal Eventually, it would be built for this Gloriette, the Belvedere-type building on the hillside. And here it is today. Here's the set piece. This is a period view of the building in the 18th century during Maria Theresa's reign by Bernardo Bellotto. Bellotto was the nephew uh, Antonio Canaletto the great scenic painter from Venice. His views of Venice were famous. Bellotto then travels throughout the various courts of Europe with his uncle's reputation, and he, he paints views of Vienna. He paints views of Dresden. Uh, and so these appear. Here you see, though, the palace in her time with the entrance forecourt. There it is today. One thing that strikes me about Schönbrunn is there is no dominant front doorway. You do not ride up to some grand portal with a broken pediment and sculptures and angels with, tri with uh, trumpets and things like that that you'd see in the usual Baroque building. You go up to the center of the building. There's a staircase that leads directly to the second level, the first floor, as would be called there, the Piano Nobile, to the great ballroom. Or when you would usually enter, you'd enter by the ground level, and there's a grotto type of room that you enter, where you access the garden directly. This is a much more, relatively speaking, informal approach to palace design than as at Versailles, where you go through. There's a, an informality here and a direct relationship to the garden. Even the execution of the building. The building is basically very flat, and there's a great deal of trompe l'oeil. This is painted decoration to look like a recessed window with a classical uh, mask above it, but this is actually flat to the wall. This is a very northern Italian tradition of, of this kind of trompe l'oeil on the exterior. But here's Bellotto's view of the garden facade. It's a wonderful document of the original parterre garden. Now, here you see Vienna in the far distance on the far right. So the steeple is of the Stefan Dom, St. Stephen's Cathedral. And then there was all countryside between the city and the palace. Now, of course, today it has been built up. But Schönbrunn was set in the midst of all of these gardens. The formal parterre, which you could look out from the second floor of the palace, 
On the right are the bosquets, the woodlands. On the left is the maze, which I'll show you a contemporary version. And then gardens will fill out uh, from there on in. drawings I'm showing you. They can be somewhat hard to read, but suffice to say, I want to talk about the plan in general terms. This is the ground level entrance. So you would come in through the very center. There, there's the spot, the, the curved stairwell that you could opt to take to go into the main rooms upstairs or enter by this. When you enter from the bottom, you first go into this grand grotto-like room rusticated stone, and then you move up in the center part of this drawing on the top into this square room and then out to the garden right away. Now, here's the main living floor. In the center, it's dominated by that grand gallery where they had receptions, it functioned as the ballroom, and then the great drawing room on the top overlooking the garden. Do you notice at the top of the image as well, you have the drawing room in the center. There are two round rooms to the left and right, these are remarkable small rooms with, jet, with the Chinese lacquer work. The entire right-hand side of the palace is the private wing, the family wing of the empress or the whatever reigning emperor. Grand state reception rooms. And then on the left-hand side of the palace are a whole series of rooms, enfilade as they call them, meaning on file or in a row from one room to the next. These were the semi-state apartments for entertaining, not as grand as the central core, but used for entertaining foreign guests. Also on the left-hand side of the image, you'll notice a white room, semicircular. That's the Imperial Chapel. Let's go in. When Maria Theresa uh, took over in 1740, she redecorated the interiors of the palace in a lighter Rococo style. Niccolo Pacassi, an Italian designer, was in charge. There's a lightness, there's a light touch here. So here's the grand room, the great chamber. On the left, it overlooks the entrance courtyard to the palace. On the right, it leads into the grand drawing room and then a view out to the formal parterre. What strikes me is the fluidity of the design, the delicacy of the ornament. The paintings on the ceiling are, of course, the glorification of the Habsburg. All of its curves, for a grand palace, there is not a lot of ornamental detail here. You have columns that divide the mirrors on the walls. There are some garlands, but that's it. White and gold are allowed to rain here, and the way light fixtures are used are meant to dissolve the walls. You'll notice particularly on the left, they mount three sconces between each doorway, two on the bottom, one on the top, in these fluid Rococo sconces. So in the evening, and this image was taken at twilight, the whole room begins to melt into a white and golden glow, and that's what Rococo design wanted, this fluid, easy sense of the curve the sensuous quality, the sinuous line. Here's a detail of the ceiling. Very much inspired. It was not by the Italian master Tiepolo from Venice, but it was inspired by his um, zigzagging, uh, almost explosive designs of angels flying through the air, but with this very delicate color palette of pale blues, golds, and reds. Chandeliers. Again, the entire room was meant to glow. That's the material point here. And as you step into the room, the next room, this is the formal drawing room that you enter. It's on the left-hand side. Here's a detail again. The ornament is quite delicate, gilded. The detail you're looking at uh, on the top of the slide is the Austrian uh, military in very chic old uniforms, may I say. They rarely won battles, but they were very stylish. Uh, the Austrians were not particularly a martial culture, but here are the great battles against Frederick the Great of Prussia, who stole the province of Silesia from Maria Theresa in the very first year of her reign in 1740 to 41, while Prussia was on the rise, and in a way, Austria's power was being threatened. The ground floor rooms. Maria Theresa married Franz Stefan of Lorraine. He was elected Holy Roman Emperor. 
on his marriage to to all invariably held by the reigning monarch of Austria. But because Maria Theresa was a woman, uh, the Holy Roman Empire would not allow a woman to reign. So her husband, her husband was given the title. Later, her son, Joseph II, would become Holy Roman Emperor, and that title would be held by Austrian monarchs until the Holy Roman Empire was abolished by Napoleon in, 18, in the early 1800s. In her older years, in her more senior years, Maria Theresa uh, commissioned a series of rooms on the ground floor of the palace overlooking the garden, and a bohemian painter called Bergel, B-E-R-G-L, produced these magnificent uh, scenic views of exotic plants, palms, as you can see in the left, orchids, various flowers, and a whole series of room that the empress would use in summer, because this is one of the uh, coolest parts of the palace. Again, the Austrians and the Habsburgs were great gardeners. Maria Theresa's husband, Franz Stefan, specifically began the Habsburg plant collection, and they would send agents throughout the empire and to plant material. And here they're painted on the walls. Excuse me there, sorry about that. Now, in the more public rooms, the reception rooms, I would say Schoenbrunn Palace shows uh, the Austrian talent for working in fine detail. This was their special skill. Mind you, Austria is a land of wood. It's a land where woodworking and plaster work, were, they were particularly adept at this. This room is the state reception room. On the left is a portrait of Maria Theresa's husband, uh, Franz Stefan, and on the painting on the right that you're looking at was her heir, Joseph, who would become Yo uh, Emperor Joseph II. He is seated on the right, and his brother, uh, the Archduke Ferdinand, is sitting on his left. A fascinating aspect of this painting, this was done while the two of them were sent to Rome on the grand tour for their classical education. The Vatican's actually in the background. And it's by Pompeo Battone, the great grand tour painter. Maria Theresa had a love for all in gold lacquer panels. You'll notice in the doorway, the overdoors, and the thin panels. These panels are so thin because this is a collection of small scale panels assembled and then integrated into this gilded, really, Rococo room. Shunran Palace is one of the finest examples of Chinese black and gold lacquer work still surviving in Europe. Last week when I lectured on Drottningholm, I talked about Queen Louisa Ulrika's Chinese pavilion, her little retreat pavilion, which had many Chinese objects and had Chinese black and gold lacquer work as well. Here at Schönbrunn, Drottning home, and there's a palace at Bayreuth in Germany, preserved uh, black and gold lacquer. And for those of us in Newport, the Elms is a remarkable example with its breakfast room of 17th century black and gold lacquer work. And when I was in charge of collections at the Preservation Society, the Elms breakfast room was undergoing rest, uh, conservation. And Jeff Moore, who's retired now, but the brilliant conservator at the Preservation Society, won a Getty grant. and. of their lacquer work so he could apply that work at the Elms. And you know, today Jeff is now in, he makes periodic trips to the Forbidden City to teach the Chinese craftspeople how to conserve black and gold lacquer work because under earlier communist regimes, the art of that was lost over time. Here's a front view of the lacquer panels integrated into the design with the portrait of Emperor Franz Stefan. Because this was a land of wood as well that I mentioned, the floors of Schönbrunn Palace are of particular interest, elaborately inlaid with a myriad number of woods because you had the woodlands of Austria, but you also had the woodlands of Hungary, Transylvania, Romania, and so they could collect various fruit woods, walnut, cherry, and other fine woods to inlay uh, these floors. Here's the, uh, excuse me, Here's the million taller chamber, as it's called. This takes small pieces of Chinese wallpaper and mounts them with here. 
Here's a detail of it. This is actually a more realistic rendering of the color. So this is a thin walnut veneer, brilliantly designed Rococo frames with little vignettes. And so again, I, for me, Schoenbrunn shines in its small details, these ex in these exquisite rooms and in its gardens. Here's another view of it. Rococo loves to dissolve the entire wall. This is not a style that throws grand arches and columns at you of the Baroque period. This is Marie Antoinette's Rococo redecoration of the palace, far more delicate, dissolving the wall. This is the room of the Gobelins. So what I'm doing, I'm walking you through the entire series, what they call semi-state apartments, where guests would be entertained when they came to visit. These are Gobelin tapestries from the 18th century on the walls, and the floor has this remarkable, again, marquetry in um, multicolored woods. I would say the floor, the designs, whereas if the Gobelin tapestries are French, ordered from the Gobelin works, and the delicate decoration of the ceiling owes much more to French Rococo. So Austrian art is always very much a fusion of Italian and uh, French traditions. And this is, this is called the blue Chinese room. This is Chinese silk stretched on the walls with these remarkable silk inserts in a, in a beautiful robin's egg blue ground. I took this photograph at night when I was visiting, so it's a little darker than in actuality. I would say it's a lighter blue color. You can see the seams. Uh, these are long strips of painted, uh, painted and embroidered silk. This room has a place in history, too. This was the room in 1918 in which the last emperor, uh, Karl, abdicated through the Treaty of Schönbrunn, all Habsburg claims to the Austrian throne. Here is one of the small rooms off of the great <clears throat> ballroom and drawing room. This was created by uh, Fort Maria Theresa. of room. It, it, the panels encase, again, Chinese black gold lacquer, but at either side of these are diminutive little shelves that contain miniature Chinese blue and white vases of the Kiangxi period, which is very, very late 17th century. And then the floor itself, which is the, it's the smallest room in the palace with the most elaborate floor. Here's a detail of it. You see the mirrors reflecting the quality of the room. But here you see on the left-hand side of the slide, especially these small Rococo shelves, uh, brackets I should call them, that then hold up these Chinese blue and white porcelains. By the way, when Maria Theresa died in the, late, <clears throat> in the set, early 1780s, she bequeathed her col a, a small collection of Japanese lacquer to her daughter, Marie Antoinette, who had magnificent pieces of furniture made. Two of those pieces of furniture are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art with black and gold lacquer used. Built Alva of Marble House here in Newport. And they, they were never in Newport, they were in her New York house. And they're now at the Met. But you can see the, Maria Theresa and then through her daughter, Marie Antoinette, needless to say, have a, had a great impact on design. Here is Maria Theresa herself with all of her children in the Red Room. What's remarkable, she ruled an empire by, and was pregnant this number of times. She never fell ill and she never lost a child in an era, of course, of high mortality. For her children, she had a theater installed at Schönbrunn. It is entirely intact designed in the mid 18th century and never changed. It's one of the rare intact court theaters. I did show one at Drottningholm last week. This is the other rare one. What I'm most taken by though, that's the royal box, is this image of the, uh, <clears throat> the, the backdrop for the stage. This is the entrance to Schönbrunn Palace. Marie Antoinette ha gained her love of theater here because the, the imperial children performed in the small theater at the Petit Trianon, inspired by this theater of her youth. Above the stage is the double eagle, the symbol of uh, the Habsburg dynasty. 
is Maria Theresa herself, you'll see two crowns that sit on the table next to her. At least two are obvious. One is the crown of Austria, one is the crown of Hungary. There's actually a third crown to the far left, the crown of um, Bohemia. Austria was never one nation state. It was really a dynastic house that ruled through by, be, by having the right to many of these crowns. So it was really this great multinational state. And Maria Theresa held it together through the force of her own will. Now we'll go back to the Burgle rooms. I want to bring you through all of them. There are several of these through the first floor. Here's the door with its, its French style trellising. It's hollyhocks on the right, all of the various plant materials, and exotic birds. Left, the garden urns, the lilies, the hostas. In the corner, what looks like a gilded tree trunk is actually a stove for heating if there was a cool summer evening. And there's the remaining walk. There were about seven rooms on this floor, these private summer apartments. And here now in the family apartments are a series of reception rooms. The first room you walk into is the antechamber, and there's the great portrait of Maria Theresa. What is so uh, compelling about these rooms are the paintings all commissioned by Maria Theresa. They would have been contemporary art at the time. But if you have visited Shonbun, or if you go, you're literally stepping back into the age of Maria Theresa in these paintings. The, paint, the large canvas on the left is uh, a great procession, or a carousel as they would call it, a great procession of horses in the square in Vienna near the Hofburg when her son Joseph II painting itself. By the way, this is pure conjecture. The square in Vienna is not this big. The building in the very center of the painting, at the very top, is the library uh, associated with the Hofburg, the imperial residence. And on the right, the domed building, is the St. Michael's Gate into the Hofburg in Vienna. The second is <clears throat> a performance in the theater uh, for Maria Theresa. So these are very rare documents, actually, of Baroque and later Rococo court life in Europe. They're very rare, and here they're presented in the palace. And this is the billiard room. On the left is a reception in the great, uh, it depicts a reception in the great drawing room of Schönbrunn Palace. And on the right is receiving a delegation, an a delegation of ambassadors on the staircase overlooking the parterre of Schönbrunn. Here's another view. You see the same reception in the drawing room on the right. On the left is a state banquet in the Grand Gallery of Schoenberg. From dress and through banquets and social occasions, the life lived in this palace in the 18th century. Here's two more portraits on the other side of the room. On the right, <clears throat> is actually the throne room in the Hofburg in Vienna, the Winter Palace, and on the left is a performance in the Spanish Riding School, also in the Hofburg in the Winter Palace. This is the family dining room, and you'll notice the family quarters are all entirely redesigned for Maria Theresa in a, a very light touch Rococo style. The paintings on the wall are uh, actually, again, famous battles from the 18th century, keep the empire together. Most of the furniture, however, is no longer 18th century. It's part of a eight, late 1840s redecorating campaign when the new 18-year-old emperor, Franz Josef, ascended the throne, the imperial throne in 1848, and he never changed a thing after that. He lived until 1916. So this is a Rococo revival style. Here's an even smaller. So this is this is the uh, the grand dining room for entertaining um, extended members of the family. This is the private family dining room in the private quarters, and that's the young Emperor Franz Josef by the painter Francis Xavier Winterhalter, uh, right after he ascended to the throne in the 1840s. 
And here's the small porcelain closet in the family quarters, decorated for Maria Theresa with hand-painted enameled uh, porcelains. She loved these intimate rooms, and the Rococo was the period of the intimate room, the small-scale room in which to retreat. Here's the small breakfast room in a little corner of the palace in the quarters overlooking the garden. And here there are portraits of her children on the walls. So it, it, it showed the love, even in the midst of the grandeur of the palace, which has 1,100 rooms, by the way, but the way the, the Habsburgs also retained a private life for themselves. Uh, they were not always... Here's an even smaller family dining room with more painted uh, 18th century Rococo uh, European porcelains and Rococo revival furniture. Because the Austrian monarchy, because they abdicated, the Habsburgs were not necessarily overthrown in a violent revolution, and a republic was proclaimed immediately. Schönbrunn became property of the state, as did the Hofburg. There was no looting. There were no sales of royal items, as in France uh, or in Russia. And so at Schönbrunn, you have the entire original inventory of the imperial family, right down to their daily china. The same can be said of the Hofburg in central Vienna. So you are looking, you're looking at an authentic environment. This is another porcelain room with small porcelain plaques, which actually were mounted to the walls by Maria Therese's daughters, this part of their, 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 their hobby, so to speak. And here's your corner of it. This is the more accurate color. It's a richer blue than the previous portrait. Again, way. This is the art of Vienna. Uh, the sense of the exquisite and of craft in plaster, porcelain, and wood. This is a, a Vienna porcelain factory chandelier, by the way. Now, porcelain, European. Chinese porcelain was all the rage in the late 17th century. But in 1722, in Saxony, in the city of Meissen, a man named Botger finally in, discovered the recipe for making soft paste porcelain. Uh, and so the Meissen was the first European porcelain factory. Soon after, factories for porcelain spread throughout Europe, and the factory at Vienna became equally famous and produced much of this. Here's the yellow room, Maria Theresa's afternoon sitting room, with its original inventory of Rococo furniture in this Italian, with, with Italian silk on the walls, all portraits of her children, And this is now the most private part of the palace. All of the white rooms I've been showing you only the imperial family was allowed here. You look down on it first, a collection of rare trees adjacent to the palace, and then arbors lined the left and the right that you can walk under. They're covered with wisteria and roses. Then you have the elaborate parterres laid out here. You also, to the left and the right, you'll notice two garden trellises. So the imperial family could walk through these, and these were also the setting for uh, uh, afternoon parties. Here's a detail of the parterre. There you see the covered walkways. There are metal trellises. Then you have the uh, wooden trellised arcades. Here you see this detail. I'm going to take you on a visual walk through this arbor. Um, the trellises themselves, very much inspired by French sources uh, from Versailles specifically. Here you have a pavilion. Let's step through to the Wisteria Walk. There are actually two pavilions. So you walk through an arbor, you see a pavilion, you walk through another arbor with a second pavilion through. And here again. Schönbrunn is a leafy green place. And because it's the site of natural springs, water was aplenty. Now you see the palace in the background, the hills beyond it. And here is the Imperial Conservatory, one of the largest in Europe. The courtyard in the center, plants and palms would be brought out here in the summer. 
they would winter over in the building on the right. One of the rare gems of the conservatory, and it still survives, is the myrtle tree given by the Sultan of the Turkish Empire to Maria Theresa. Let's, let's take a look here. Here's the conservatory. Now it's summertime, so the plants are in the central parterre. But the emperors also used this for entertaining. They loved their plants so much. They did not always use the grand reception rooms of the main palace. For example, they would entertain visiting monarchs in the conservatory. During the Congress of Vienna in 1815, after Napoleon's defeat, find the map of Europe and reestablish royal authority. The emperor at the time, uh, Ferdinand, entertained at a grand dinner in this space. And there it is. The great vaulted space banked with flowers, rare plants, and then the displays on the table were all from the royal hothouses. Grapes, fruit, rare mandarin oranges, clementines, pineapples. So here's an example of that level of entertaining in the conservatory because the Habsburgs so loved their gardens. Now as we make our way into the garden, here's the maze that I showed you from the Bellotto painting in real life today. The gardens are very close to their original design. This maze is still carefully maintained. This magnificent the oak tree in the very center of it and then as you get off the path, you then uh, venture into the woodlands. And here are the clipped hornbeams. Acres and acres of these descending into the bosquets. Now this is very much a 19th century design you see today. All of the flowers are still grown from seed every year in the greenhouses. And there's a view to the Gloriette, the crowning achievement on the hill. And I'll bring you up to it. There it is from a distance. Getting closer. Here it is with its reflecting pool at the top of the hill. Open loges at either side, and then a glassed in room in the very center where the Empress could uh, use it as her afternoon office or have parties here, dinners, teas. Here's the approach. These are trophy designs. These are, these are literally piles of ancient Roman armor, breastplates, swords, helmets. The Gloriette was meant to celebrate, again, these, the, well, as the Empress would like to think of, victories and battles uh, uh, won by the, her empire. Frankly, her story is not the story of victory. It's the story of survival, which is a victory in its own way. But the Austrian Empire was really becoming no match for the power of France or the, po the emerging power of Prussia. But they still had this military quality on the approach to the Gloriette. And there's a view of the Gloriette at night. As you leave the Gloriette, you descend into these bosquets again, uh, remarkable trees. Uh, here are hornbeam grown over into arches. Here it is in a fall photograph. And then you make your way here. At the end is, are the uh, Roman ruins designed by Mar uh, Maria Therese and her son, Joseph II, after he came back from his grand tour, his stay in Rome, where he was, of course, fascinated by all the Roman antiquities. And so this was, one, this was the ceremonial garden where you were meant to find your way into the Roman ruins. Let's pull back for a second. Here you see the palace in the middle of the photograph, making way to the Gloriette, the Roman ruins would be in that woodland to the left, on the left-hand side of the slide, deep in the woods. And then on the right-hand side of the slide in the center is the imperial greenhouse and the imperial zoo, started by Maria Theresa's husband, one of the finest zoos in Europe in its day. Here's the greenhouse. Now the greenhouse brings us into the 19th century. One of the largest and earliest cast iron and glass greenhouses on, uh, on the European continent. It was developed in the 1850s and early 60s by Emperor Franz Josef, but the man in charge of it was the emperor's younger brother, Maximilian, the Archduke Maximilian. 
Anthony and the Far East to create a, a, one of the finest collections of plants in Europe, and he did so. Now, Maximilian would later, ill-advised, accept the invitation to become the emperor of Mexico, where he was eventually assassinated. Here's the view of it. It's fluid lines. Let's go inside for a moment. White cast iron. So again, the, the Austrian archdukes were all, almost always gardeners. Again, this palace is so related to nature. Here's Maximilian and his wife Carlotta of Belgium. And now let's meet Franz Josef, uh, who reigned in Austria from 1848 to 1916. And we'll look at his private quarters. He was very military in his bearing, and he considered himself, of course, he was referred to as his imperial and apostolic majesty, but he was also the first servant of the state. Very, very dutiful. I think he was next to Louis XIV, the longest reigning monarch in Europe, but I do believe the present Queen Elizabeth was a great sense of duty. You see the bed in the right-hand corner? That is a military camp bed. And he rose with military precision every day, sometimes at 4.30. His interiors are, for, for his imperial majesty, are very stark. They were decorated in the 1840s, and they never changed. The electric light in the chandelier was added after his death. Thomas Edison was actually brought to Schönbrunn to electrify the palace, which was allowed, again, even against the emperor's wishes, but he refused to pay the bill. So the government had to step in and finally pay the bill. Here's the emperor's reception room, again in a walnut veneer, you know, beautifully done. And as you walk through here, the private chambers, his study with a portrait of his wife, the other part of his study, his changing room, again, nothing has changed. This is as he left it. He died in 1916, the war was in full force, World War I, and his uh, uh, nephew, uh, Carl became emperor, but resigned emperor and his emperor Zeta to change the palace. So you're looking at a time capsule. And here's the emperor's sitting room, again, with he and his wife, the Empress Elizabeth. She was nicknamed Cece and was considered the most beautiful woman in Europe at the time. She hated Schönbrunn Palace and almost never stayed in it because she did not like rigid court ceremonial, as relaxed as the Habsburgs were. So she stayed in a small villa on the grounds of Schönbrunn Palace. So even she didn't make her mark on the palace as much. This is why the palace is really the Rococo creation of Maria Theresa, because no other monarch really put their imprint on the palace itself. Here is the Empress Elizabeth's uh, chambers at uh, Schönbrunn. When she did stay, this is her workout in equipment. This is her exercise for her, her daily exercise regimen. And there she is, in one of the emperor's favorite portraits of her, in her morning déshabillé, as the French would say, her négligé. And here's the last emperor, Carl, and the emperor Zetron. And here you see this. In, one, in the million dollar chamber. This is Karl, the last emperor of Austria, who saw that the empire was collapsing and decided again through the Treaty of Schönbrunn to uh, abdicate and leave the country. Here is the palace actually in World War II. It was partly bombed, uh, but it was restored. And of course, it still receives the world. This is Jacqueline Kennedy when she and the president uh, attended a state function at Schönbrunn Palace in 1962 uh, when uh, the president met with Nikita Khrushchev, who's on the right hand side. Uh, Jacqueline, they said, finally brought some life back into the palace. They said, ah, finally, someone regal has finally entered the domain of Schönbrunn yet again. Someone asked Khrushchev after the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, would the world have been different? What would have been different if, if he, Khrushchev, had been assassinated rather than President Kennedy? He said, well, I think back to that evening, I paraphrase, Aristotle Onassis would not have married Mrs. Khrushchev. Such was the impression made uh, upon him by 
Jacqueline Kennedy in the setting of Schönbrunn on the old communist. I end with this image, Schönbrunn today. It's remarkably unchanged. But again, I'd like to leave you with this one idea, humorous as it might sound. It's one of the most informal, formal Baroque palaces for a grand imperial family. But there's a softness and a gentleness to the palace. And why not? It's a palace named for a beautiful well. That is my story, and I'm more than happy uh, now. We'll uh, click over to the uh, chat feature on this so I can take any questions, comments, uh, observations you might have. So if there's anything anyone would like to ask, please feel free. One thing as I'm waiting for any question, I'd like to end with as well. Schönbrunn Palace is designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Right. So it's number one because of its it, the quality of it's so intact, as I've shown. And it is a symbol of the Habsburg, of Habsburg culture, of a cultural fusion of Italian, French, Germanic design during the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and so uh, it's also very much owned by the people of Vienna. It's really considered a city park, and it's opened at all times. I don't necessarily see questions coming through, so I think I'll end here and I'll uh, hand the podium back to Benedict Leica. So thank you very much for having me. John, thank you very much. Very informative as always. Um, I want to remind everyone uh, that the third and fourth installments of uh, the series will be not next week, but the week after. And what will that be on, John, the, the next palace? the Russian palace, and then Sans Souci in France. So, uh, John, thank you again. And uh, I want to first uh, encourage everybody that is currently watching to uh, join as a member, uh, subscribe to our, our YouTube channel, all those things. So please, please do that. Um, next week, though it's not gonna be John Church, um, an excellent program. You might recall a few years ago when we mounted an exhibition on the Lafayette Escadrille, the crack team of uh, French and Americans, uh, including uh, Norman Prince, uh, who in the very early days of aviation joined the French against the Germans. And so um, uh, Paul Glenshaw, who is one of the leading experts in the history of the Lafayette Escadrille, uh, was the co-curator of that exhibition, if you recall. And he has since then created uh, with a man named Dirac Greer, uh, and they share directing and writing credits, uh, a new movie uh, called The Lafayette Escadrille. And we'll be uh, getting a sneak preview of that uh, very fine film next week. Uh, and I'll just read you very quickly the kind of the blurb that describes it. Filmed in the skies above France in the United States, the documentary, The Lafayette Escadrille, tells the story of the American volunteers who flew and fought for France in World War I, becoming the founding squadron of American combat aviation. So, uh, and it is chock full of uh, vintage photos and real rarities and all sorts of um, you know, things that you might not find in the usual sources on, on this important chapter in aviation history. So, uh, I want to thank you, uh, everyone, again, for joining us tonight. I want to thank John Church. And then, of course, John Church will return the following week and the week after. Thank you so much. Good evening. <laughs>